Alright, bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah we start today uh, talking about a very important topic which uh, these two are really the experts on. I'm just going to be like a commentary, a super commentary on your commentary. And uh, so the top, we're going to talk about uh, songs and lyrics and their effect and and specifically with reference to how uh, they, uh, the, the people or ins the devilish inspirations uh, through the songs, they tend to change the meaning of things, meaning of words. Uh, like uh, Imam Isa gave a very good example earlier today uh, while talking to some of the youth that how we use the word normalize, right? We nor use the nor word normalize to normalize something to something that's not normal, you know? It wasn't so, normal, so we have to normalize it. Right. So something wasn't, it was a, it not according to Fitras, you normalize it. So we're going to do that with looking at some uh, lyrics, some songs, and uh, talk about songs uh, at maybe at a higher level, but specifically uh, lyrics and then how they change the meaning of things using lyrics. Okay, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So, uh, Brother Isa, you want to start off? Sure. Uh, Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu salamu ala rasulillah. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise him, we thank him, we ask him to exalt the mention of Nabi Muhammad, alayhi salatu salam. So, um, so there's a couple of interesting verses that, that uh, indicate uh, to the believer when we ponder over them a little bit deeply. Um, this is an interesting one. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, tells us that you know the the shaitan right in uh, Surah Luqman right he uses his voice to to mislead the believers and then you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here and we'll just read let's just read the first translation here it says and cite to senselessness whoever you can among them so this is Allah talking to shaitan with your voice and assault them with your horses and foot soldiers and become a partner in their wealth and their children and promise them. The shaitan does not promise them anything but delusion, right? So here we, we know that the shaitan is going to have some sort of way of capturing our attention through some sort of auditory means. So in our last uh, episode, we talked about the entertainment business and how it's, uh, you know, Hollywood and all the rest of them are deeply, deeply involved in the occult and that they're deeply involved in effectively being an amplifier for the voice of the Shaitan, uh, who's made a promise to mislead all of mankind uh, without exception. So there's another interesting verse in the Quran that we need to combine with this one, which is an accusation that Allah makes against uh, some of Beni Israel. So can you share it? So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ba'da'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Min al-ladhina hadu yuharrifun al-karima an mawadi'ihi wa yaquluna sami'na wa asayna wa asma' ghayra musma'in wa ra'ina. So this is a, an accusation uh, against the, uh, the Jews, the disbelieving Jews. Uh, among them are those who make tahrif of things, right? So there's different ways to understand this word. Um, it could mean that the nas of something is corrupt. The actual text of something is corrupt. And there, uh, for example, we know Beni Israel at one point, the Torah is brought to the Prophet Islam, and he wants them to read an ayah about stoning uh, the one who's committed zina or adultery, and the rabbi puts his finger over the punishment so that no, they don't have to read it. So that's one example of tahrif, right? But then there's another interesting one, which is tahrif of ma'ani, like corruption of meaning, right? So this is actually one of the most fascinating ones. So let's go to an example from the entertainment business where the, the meaning of a word is now being redefined. OK, so there's a very famous song that uh, used to come on the radio and still does from a very famous occult band. And we mentioned them in the last episode, Led Zeppelin. 
So Led Zeppelin, they had a guitarist named Jimmy Page, and Jimmy Page was actively involved in the occult. In fact, he either bought or he rented Aleister Crowley's uh, home in Britain. Hmm. And yeah, he yeah, and so I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe he even used it to record some of Led Zeppelin's material. I don't know. Someone should look into that more. But they wrote a song called A Whole Lot of Love. So let's look at the lyrics for that. Um, now, how do we traditionally understand love, right? Well, prior to the 20th century, I mean, love is mahabba, right? It's uh, affection between two people. I mean, it can mean a lot of things, but let's see how this word is being used in this song. So here's Led Zeppelin, A Whole Lot of Love. Uh, so I'm just going to read the lyrics for you and you come to your own conclusions. Uh, we won't listen to the song because the song makes it even more obvious what he's talking about. So he says, you need cooling, baby, I'm not fooling. I'm going to send you back to schooling away down inside. And this is, of course, very graphic what he's getting at. But uh, honey, you need it. I'm going to give you my love. I'm going to give you my love. Uh, so want a whole lot of love, want a whole lot of love. He just keeps repeating this. Now to the to the ignorant masses who are, have no context for this. At some point during this song, Robert Plant, the singer, starts making very sexually provocative sounds, uh, moaning and groaning. Uh, it gets to the point where you start understanding like, oh, he's using the word love for sex, right? Exactly. But what he's doing for the uninitiated audience is he's making them think that sex is love. And it's exactly not, it's an it's aspect not. well yeah and this is something that i think a lot of the teenagers are, have been trapped in right they want attention they want love and they think this is the this is what love is this is how you get it mm -hmm. not not only that but i i tend to take a class in in so i have an audio engineering degree and we had to take a class called the history of rock and roll and it became very, very apparent to me from this class how sexuality is put, has been pushed on the sp specifically the American culture and then the wider culture of the world through songs. So one of the uh, earliest guitarists uh, who became very famous for practically inventing blues and R&B music and rock and roll is Robert Johnson. Have you ever heard of Robert Johnson? Robert Johnson is the guy who's famous for the movie um, The Crossroads. So he was a African-American guitarist in the South, uh, in Mississippi, I believe, or Alabama one, who was pretty, like, not well known. All the people that knew him said he was a pretty terrible guitar player, but he knew of a place in his area called the Crossroads. If you go there, you'll meet the devil, and then you can make a deal with the devil. Mm. Now, Ro uh, Robert Johnson disappeared for six months. And the, the story is he went to the crossroads. Now, six months later, he came back and everyone said that he was like the most amazing guitar player they'd ever seen. Mm. Now, he died very early in life. Um, but his music to this day, if you go read the lyrics, and we can't even read the lyrics, they're so disgusting on even Sheikh Omar's channel. Uh, but the lyrics of some of his songs are about the devil always following him, but also they're incredibly sexually graphic very graphic i mean even for 2021 um and this was 1930s he's writing this music but wow. robert johnson went on to influence every guitar player in, in in the entertainment business whether it was robert plant or uh the beatles or any of them uh uh keith richards from um the rolling stones all of them so in my history of rock and roll class we started learning about like the songs and the names of the styles of music so there was a song that came out in the early 50s called the locomotion everybody's doing a loco uh, or uh, everybody's doing a brand new dance now come on come on do the locomotion well the locomotion dance is this chicken and we're turning around it's me getting behind <laughs> you and doing like this and then, then we're all in a chain doing it together oh, right yeah, i've seen that yeah, yeah so this you know you, you may not realize this but this is a euphemism for sex Oh. Yeah, but yeah. it was so innocent at that time. Like no one saw it, right? And yeah. and you can look up a lot of these old classic songs that we we sung sung in like elementary school. You know, when, when I was in elementary school in the late '80s and early early '90s, the uh, 
that all of these songs are euphemism for sex. Think about this, hip hop, hip hop, your, your hips hopping back and forth, rock That's and awesome. roll, rock and roll in the bedroom, right? They're all oh. euphemisms for sex. Stuff yes, exactly. exactly. And, and so they're, they're pushing constantly onto the society uh, this like hypersexualization. And it's about changing the meaning of the word. Bingo. Love yeah. now becomes sex as opposed to, you know, the many things that love means, the relationships, you know. They're redefining word. They're changing the meanings of the words from their places. Yeah, and, this, and what's interesting to build on that is if you notice, they constantly interchange lust and love, and they never really educate the young girls to be like, hey, you know, that lust is going to flee as soon as it's over. You're nothing to that person. He's gone. And love is something that you could be tortured for that person. Like you would go to the ends of the earth, like that old chivalric type of, you know, courtly love almost type of thing from the 14th and 15th century is much different than you know today's models of hey you know i have this quick impulse that i need to get rid of and then as soon as that's over your love is gone so they've changed love to be like so you know like minute men like literal minute men you know they're in and they're out you know wham bam thank you ma'am and so now they've confused what love is to such a degree that they almost can't even recognize it anymore. And this leads them to also hating men too. Mm -hmm. And for men to kind of not even know what attachment means, what, you know, duty to a family means and this sort of powerful bond and love. So it really has, like you said earlier, you know, they've played with the word so much that they've lost certain meanings, you know? And it's a real form of sophistry to kind of lead people to create new words, to change new words, to adopt old words, and then change the meaning. Cultural Marxists do this quite a lot um, to socially engineer your psychology towards where they want you to go. Mm. But instead of creating a new world, a new word, they take over your old ones. And then you're like, wait a minute, I thought this was that. And it's like, no, it's now this, you know, so very good points i have to, i concur the said about alcohol they'll change the the meaning of the word alcohol but it'll still be alcohol right yeah, yeah. and in the time and the problem and this is one of the problems right is that unfortunately the ummah has fossilized everything into the past mm -hmm. without bringing like for example when the quran or when the aisha the whole issue of assalamu alaikum versus salam alaikum right that they would say may death be upon you to the prophet instead of may peace be upon you to the prophet and Aisha would get angry and she would want to respond and the prophet told her just say to them and it's the same to you you probably know the tradition of the prophet is very famous so this type of thing was happening in Medina a lot it's word magic actually uh, yeah it's it's a type of spell right and uh and it's still continuing today and but we don't take those lessons. We think, oh, that happened at that time, and uh, we don't realize how it still plays a role. Yeah, and actually, that was my whole point of bringing up that ayah from the Quran, where Allah criticizes, right, the Jews for for. So even to this day, they'll still use, and this is kind of tangentially related, but they'll say like, oh, if you criticize uh, Israel, you're anti-Semitic, right? right? But clearly, the original meaning of anti-Semitic would be including Arab people and any Semitic person. So how can a Muslim, uh, you know, I had this issue one time, I used to teach at a college, and uh, I invited a speaker to talk about a human rights issue, and he came, but he happened to also criticize Israel. So he, he came, and, and the, the Jewish people on campus, specifically the Zionist Jews, they became very upset that he was coming and I had to go talk to the Jewish leader or whatever. And of course she brought up anti-Semitism. And I said, well, hold on a second. Like we believe in all of the prophets of the children of Israel. Okay. Like without exception, and we don't reject them or criticize them or anything. And furthermore, our prophet is an Arab peace be upon him. You know, like he, by definition is Semitic. So calling a Muslim anti-Semitic is nonsensical. Like you're redefining that word and weaponizing i had to actually learn that you know and i learned that from muslims i was like i didn't know that so it's a very good example yeah actually uh shibli's a man uh in texas um he actually mentioned something interesting about the 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 tafsir a possible 
related tafsir to this ayah. He says, in the Quran, where Allah says that the Jews proclaimed, Sami'na wa asayna, we hear and we disobey, meaning we hear and we uh, uh, disobey, is a pun off the uh, same incident in Deuteronomy, which is the Torah, chapter 5, verse 27, where it says in Hebrew that, uh, and I'm, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, uh, it's pronounced nearly identically, washima uh, nu wa asinu, which means in Hebrew, we hear and we disobey. God is saying something that they say they will obey, but did the exact opposite and worship the calf instead. This is evidence that God was speaking in a paranormastic language or a form of what is called al jinas in Arabic rhetoric. Maybe you know this term better than me. Um, that is that the rabbis would know for the purpose of proving to them that the Prophet ﷺ couldn't have possibly written it. These are possibly the little clues that we don't know about where we read in various narrations that a rabbi suddenly accepted Islam. These clues would have been just for them and it would have convinced them. Others wouldn't have known about it and thought, wow, he is suddenly accepting Islam. This is just a small sample of the multitude of examples displaying the miraculous nature of the glorious Quran. So we know that people do this, that they're gonna do it. And like you said, we're not thinking, okay, is this being done in our time? And how is it being done? And how is changing the definition of a word affecting my mind and your mind and changing our mm-hmm. worldview? Yeah, I was just thinking the first, yeah, all you people who believe, has to do with this topic. It's, I think, ayah number, um, ayah number one of uh, 114 of Surah Al-Baqarah, where it tells the Muslims, be careful what type of language you use. Uh, let me just show you very quickly here. Oh, this is the one you're talking about where, where we're supposed to say, and we're criticizing them for saying, yes, exactly. So, this, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. so if you come here, Right over here, I number one o four. Okay, ya yu ladina amanu, o you people who believe, la taqulu ra'ina. This is the first o you people who believe in the Quran. Interesting. In in the in the four. So this the first thing, is about be careful of the words you use and the effect it has. So in the classical traditional tafsir, ya yu ladina amanu, la taqulu ra'ina. Don't say ra'ina, ra'ina, ra'in. It, you also know means shepherd. Right. right? Kunukum, ra'ina. Our shepherd. So. It has also that, so anything that has a dual meaning, right, has a dual meaning, can mean this, can mean that. When you're uh, antagonistic, is you're an, the person that's antagonistic is using a word with a double meaning with you, mm. implying one, but maybe meaning the other, you should not adapt those words and you should be careful of those words. Okay. Qulu qawlan sadida. Speak yes. straight with people. So yeah, exactly. Just let the words mean what they mean and don't use double-edged words like with double meanings. So we, so the whole entertainment industry has done that as the previous verse with his voice, right? right. Shaitan's voice with his. And this is just one of the many tricks. Ya amanu la ra'ina wa zunna. But say, oh prophet, give us attention and Listen to us. And for the people who reject the truth is a painful punishment. Well, it's interesting because it's like they're using the word metaphorically here, ra'ina, but the Quran is saying, no, 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 take the meaning that you wanted from that, which is that the the the, the shepherd he gives attention and listens to the flock, right? But they're, uh-huh. they're, they're using it to say that he is a shepherd, and so he's nothing, and why would anyone listen to him? He's just that, that boy from Mecca who used to shepherd sheep, and you know he's not worthy to be a prophet. Uh, yeah, actually, that's, that's very, very fascinating. The, um, not, not only that, sometimes I, I, I wonder how many words we're using all the time, because words program your mind. As you use oh, yeah. them, you actually cause yourself to think and look at the world a certain way. Um, and we were talking earlier today. To the, to so the... also notice it has 13 words in the ayah, if I counted correctly. Oh. So the wa, the, the harfajars, you include it in the word, by the way. So 
Ya Yuhladina Amanu, okay. Uh, that's gonna be Ya Ayuha is one. Alladina okay? Amanu mm La -hmm. Takulu Ra'ina is how many? One, two, three, four, five. Uh Ra'ina is six, seven, eight, wasma'u, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, then I think uh did we count twelve or thirteen? I think you got to twelve. Yeah, yeah, one anyway, we can uh look at that later on. But if you notice, like this is also one and three, which is about magic over here. This is and then oh, right it's, after it's right after, after the ayat about magic. Magic, right. So, la so, ilaha illallah. so this is the words about the Harut Harut and Marut teaching magic. Right, uh -huh. and then right after Allah mentions that Harut and Manu taught Bani Israel magic, it's saying talk about word magic. <laughs> it's talking about word magic in a sense, meaning because of the connection of the interrelationship between the verses. Well, I mentioned in our last episode too, and and, and me and my brother were, were talking more about this three, afterwards about two, three, four, five, the six, words seven, in the, eight, that are used 10, in magic, like 11, so 12, thirteen. So there is thirteen words. You're right. Yes. So, so in, 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 what is, what is a, uh, what do they call, and, and I'll, I'm, I may be repeating myself from last time, but your audience that sees this episode will, will, it'll be maybe new for some of them, is I talked about how the magician casts his spell, right? So what, what mm -hmm. is a radio uh, program called? It's called a broadcast. Right, right. right? Cast, yes. And no, it's that's a, so true, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's, and, 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 and the same thing for television, it's a broadcast. It's, Casting a spell. Right. And not only that, it's a program. You're watching and listening to programs. <laughs> you're being programmed. Yeah. yeah, you're being programmed. Yeah. And it tells um, you, you're daily programming. Remember the TV guide? It would tell you, like, your programming for this day will be, you know, at this time, at this time. I don't know if that's kind of old school, but there right. was, like, the, the those planners that used to come in the mail from Reader's Digest. My grandpa used to subscribe to it and get the TV guide. It's like a coffee table book. I don't know if the young youth will know what we're talking about. What we know. Um, we know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, yeah, and not only that, but uh, what do they call it, it? It comes in in waves. So the 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 magician he waves his staff to cast the spell, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. the the uh, the the orchestral. Uh, uh, what's the guy called? I don't know why this is not coming to me. The conductor. The conductor. Yeah, the conductor is sending out his waves to the orchestra and waving the wand at them and then they obey and they slow down and speed up they they crescendo and decrescendo they get louder and softer right so so this the, the one of the things that is mentioned uh is that some of the intelligence agencies uh have been accused of and you know we we can we can prove it or not prove it of actually using the music industry to to incite the public or oh use, yes most definitely using the Absolutely. entertainment business funding movies about war funding movies yeah, about yes. yeah definitely most definitely most yeah. definitely now where do we find the proof of this and this is the hadith that i had sheikh omar bring up and this is the this is the kal, kal hasir you can do this one right here. yeah so so if you're this not, hadith is muttafaqun alayh and notice the rawi the narrator is hudayfa Remember Hudayfa in end times. Yes, very important. He's the secret keeper of the prophet. Okay, so the the rawi here is a very specialized ra rawi, meaning the person who's narrating this hadith is an extra special companion of the prophet, who's well known for narrations, but he is specializing specifically. He's telling the people about the signs of the end times, and and so this has to do with that in a way. Okay, and you'll, I'll let Brother um, Isa explain it. Let's but I just wanted to kind of like introduce this. Uh, just move the, this out of the way. Okay. Okay, so look at this hadith. Now, Hamza Yusuf, uh, may Allah Should preserve I just him. do the English? Uh, well, we might look at an Arabic here and there, but yeah, you can just zoom it in. So listen to this. This, this is the most amazing hadith ever, in, in my opinion, about signs of the hour that's just clear, crystal clear. Uh, if one if one just uses a little bit of brain power, so so this is a, on the authority of Hudayfa, who's the great narrator of signs of the hour and 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 the future. And it says we were sitting in the company of Omar, meaning Omar ibn al-Khattab. Okay, but that's uh, this is also interesting because 
remember, Omar was always concerned about the signs of the hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he is another person who is also very concerned. And he has been told by Hodefa already that it's your death that will unleash fit the, the yeah. fitans. Okay. Yeah. So Omar is already like, uh, he asked Hodefa, there's not in this narration, but in another narration, he asked Hodefa. Hudayfa also had the secrets of the prophets, of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So Umar like went to Hudayfa and said, swear by Allah, I'm not one of the hypocrites, right? So Hudayfa said, don't worry, you're not one of them, but don't come back, ask me any more questions. And then, <laughs> and then, and then Umar went back to Hudayfa one day and said, uh, when will the, you know, the fitans happen? And, and then he, they're now talking in a symbolic language. You know, he, he says, there's a door. As long as it's there, there will be no problems. But when that, you know, then he says, will the door be broken or will it be open? Like, how will it happen? He says, the door will be broken, meaning he will die. He will be killed. Omar will be killed. And from there, the problems will be unleashed. So also notice that Hudayfa and Omar have a very good relationship. Mm. They have a very strong relationship. So Hudayfa is in a very good place to narrate something about Omar. And of course, as you can see here, it starts with we were sitting in the company of Omar and he said. So he says, who amongst you has heard the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talking about the fitna, the turmoil? And I think uh, in Arabic, it's in the singular, right? Yeah. Okay. So the next thing he says is some people. And, and notice that it has the alif lam ma'arif al fitna. Yeah. So it's, it's like the, the fitna. Yeah. And I'm telling you, this is, he explains the worst one of all. So some people said um, it was we who heard uh, upon this uh, be, uh, be remarked. Perhaps a turmoil, you presume that un unrest of man in regards to his household or neighbor. They replied, yes, he, Omar, observed. Such an unrest would be done away with by prayer, fasting, and charity. So I think he's dismissing one interpretation. Said, no, so, uh, so they were asking... They were talking about turmoil and they said, well, you know, I'm not asking you about the turmoil that can be removed by prayer and charity right. and that that's what, so he's saying, I'm asking about the real turmoil. Mm. Okay. The big one that cannot be therefore averted by salah. It cannot be averted by Hajj. It cannot be averted by fasting and giving salah. Wow. So this is like the, the meaning they're the normal fitans. And you, it's not raining. We have a, dr a drought. You do the, you know, salah through. Uh, you do the salah for the rain, and the rain will, inshallah, come down, right? And certain doors are closed because the whole society is sinning. But this is that sin that cannot be removed by good deeds. It says, but who amongst you has heard from the apostle describing the turmoil? Now listen to this, which would come like waves of the ocean yeah it says moj right in yeah moj yeah, yeah. Moj the al -bahar. Mujul, moj al -bahar. it will move like the waves of the sea meaning one wave then the next wave and the next wave unending right. one problem then you got a bigger problem then another bigger problem and then another bigger problem and every time you think this is the big problem another problem comes it's that you say no now this is so we had 9 11 which we thought was a big problem right and now we got this, you know, Circus, Circus 19. 19, right? So it, it's just one deception, one problem after another. Now, keep this in mind, because when he describes what the fitna is, you're going to, this word wave is going to become important. Okay, so Hudayfa said, the people hushed into silence. I replied, it is I, um, uh, uh, it is I. So Hudayfa knows about this fitna, and he's about to tell you. So he, Omar, said, uh, you and your father are very pious. And so Hudayfa said, I heard the messenger of Allah saying, observing that fitan, so mul multiple fitans now, uh, temptations would be presented to men's hearts, kal halsir, like a flat mat, udan udan, line by line. Now, for those of you who haven't been to the Middle East before, I went to Egypt last year and I went to a friend's house in Northern Egypt in a, near a city called Tanta. And we went to his garden and he put out a house here. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is it's, it's an old mat where it's interwoven lines. Like 
you have lines going vertically and horizontally over each other to create a pattern. And if you know how to weave them properly and color them properly, you can create a picture through your weaving, okay? But what you're really seeing is just a bunch of small squares that are col colored in different ways to make a picture appear as if it's there. It's also interesting when you weave, you're actually going in and then out, mm -hmm. in and out, just like a wave, right? So, so, Very good point. so he continues, and any heart which is impregnated by them, okay, will have a black mark put on it. But any heart which rejects them will have a white mark put on it. Now, I don't think the prophet is literally talking about your physical heart and heart disease here. He's talking about, and Allah knows best, the spiritual insight that your, your spiritual heart gives you. So the blackness, and Allah knows best, could be your inability to see things as they really are. Your, yeah. So you can think of like this with the nur, right? Where it describes light upon light, and it's the shining lamp. So if the lamp is sort of say your lens but the glass around it is getting stained now that light is not coming out right it's so stained so now your your ability to see reality is being affected and so you only Very see, good point. you know you only see physical things you don't see the metaphysical reality so yes so it says the result of that will become two types of hearts so in the future when this is happening and, and it's, it affects people they're going to be doing the two camps one which is the process we're going through bigger. right now this is the process we're going through right now Layla, Layla, which i sometimes start this dark dark this, night the dark night the prophet that you know that lasts from either 12 years or 18 years based upon the hadiths you're looking at but this this is the time where people will be pushed towards those two camps now the result is that there'll be two types of hearts: one white, like a white stone, which has not been uh, not been harmed by any tor turmoil or temptation, so long as the heavens and the earth endure; and one which is black and dust covered, like a vessel which is upset, meaning like a it's like a cup that's been turned upside down. You can't pour anything into it. It says not recognizing what is good or rejecting what is evil like munkar yeah, they're like zombies they don't right. know what's wrong what's wrong and the fitra has been changed and then it says at the end that they'll be uh yeah, they've been turned upside down right they uh they've been inverted yeah. yeah so so the 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 um the one that's impregnated uh by all this will be filled with hawa passions desires right and so then hudayfa goes on to yeah. narrate yep uh, hawa min hawa yep um, so I want to just propose to your audience this. What do we know today? It's flat. Okay. And it it shows you tempting things and turmoil. And it's composed of small little squares that are colored in a way to make a picture appear, right? Comes pixels, in waves, pixels, pixels right? Yeah, yeah you're there it is. TV. It's what you're looking at right now. It's your TV. It's your smartphone. It's all of these things and Alana's knows best. And what it's doing to people is it's blackening their insight, their ability to see. And that's why so many of them today are absolutely fooled. They've had the broad cast of the spell onto them. And it's been going on for years. It's been coming like waves. It comes in like Wi-Fi waves. It comes in like waves uh airways this is why it's very important for all of us that are trying to be practicing muslims i heard one great scholar i'm not going to take his name but i heard one great scholar say your soul is as big as your screen meaning as as big as your soul becomes as small as your screen when you're always attached to it mm -hmm. right so you need time off like go to sleep with this off you know unless you need the alarm for pleasure but basically you need time off from this you, you have to have time off from, from these devices. You know, every day, one or two hours, and then like certain days, like they would used to have the Sabbath, do it longer, right? Just like time off. And uh, so that you can not be attached to this uh, as, 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 as much as they would want you to be attached to it. And to, you know, always be careful with these phones. When you pick it up, say Bismillah, because it is, it has good in it, but it also has evil in it. So... You want to always be, you know, when you touch it, say Bismillah, and just be careful that it could affect you positively, it could affect you negatively. You know, Very true. certainly dangerous. 
yeah it's 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 not yeah. good for the soul but you know it's a need and this is part of the problem it's a need and so you have to be very careful of your relationship with this and what you do with very it true. I used to tell the, the Muslim parents when I would talk to them about the youth, I said, I said, when you give your child one of these, you're basically handing them a loaded weapon to shoot their faith. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. like the, uh, because yeah. what's available there is absolutely the most horrific things that your consciousness could ever be exposed to. Like there's literally what, what we, what we have exposed people to today uh, is so horrific and so such munkar that it's really hard to imagine that it could get any worse. Like I mentioned, uh, like the spread of pornography is the, the, uh, the, the coming to fruition of the prophecy of the prophet that people would be having intercourse in public and the best of them would say, hey, can you just go to an alleyway and do mm -hmm. that? Well, in reality, I mean, the, the prophet mentioned that zina is the zina of the eyes, the ears, the feet, the hand, like he didn't just limit it to the private part. He said that it's beyond that. So you're, you're looking at people in public <laughs> committing Zina on your phone. And if someone saw you do that, they'd say, Hey man, this is not really the place for that. You should go do that in private, <laughs> but it's literally exactly what's happened. This thing mm -hmm. is the, the biggest weapon that the magicians that run the entertainment business have used. This started with your TV and then it became your laptop and your, your PC. And then now it's this, and this thing is now everywhere with you. And eventually Allah knows best. They just want to implant it in your brain where it's yes. just something that you can access all the time. And you're, it's a totally, you're watching a movie while talking to your friends, you know? Right. And so this, and, you know, just coming back to something I was saying is that the prophet would not talk to people after Isha prayer. Meaning he would he would only talk to his wives after Isha. Mm. After Isha was his family time, basically. I mean, he had time before that with his family too. But after Isha, he would not talk to the public, the prophet. After Isha, he would spend time with his wives or go to sleep or do his prayers alone. He would not talk to the public. Okay. And so this was kind of like his time off from social the, media the social media the, yeah whatever was there at that time he would completely turn off from it so you know I, I i i think we should you know buy one of those old type of alarms and just shut off and also the radiation that comes out of this mm -hmm. like waves uh, like waves and 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 people have told me they have much better sleeps when they turn this off you know some of my yeah, students, i put my phone on airplane mode at night your alarm can still work but if you put on airplane mode it blocks anyone from sending you notifications or anything like that till the morning did you just take that out of my head i was right about to say that oh, for real <laughs> yeah the exact same thing yeah okay mashallah so um yeah all right so sister i think you wanted to and you also wanted to go through some songs or lyrics did we already do your lyrics i'll mention the main one i mean i, I, I there's so many songs you could use but i for me the, the whole lot of love is one i always use as an example because as an example of changing the meaning yeah, in other words like as uh, milan so beautifully mentioned the love becomes lust right mm -hmm. and so yes. they're they're pushing the idea that that real love is just simply relegated to your sexual desires and that's it it doesn't go beyond that that's that's many i mean your audience can now take that to a whole nother and see it where it's been done in so many different levels okay so then we have another song dark horse that the sister mentioned so i'll let you take over over here okay so i'll read it and then we'll kind of both break it down and then as i get to it you'll scroll down so it says i knew you were you were going to come to me, and here you are. So if just with those three first lines, you see, like, she's saying, I knew, and she's talking to an entity, right? Because I'm capable of anything, of anything and everything. So right there, you can totally see that she's talking about intimacy, right? And committing certain deeds that go beyond the normal means of how you would normally interact within the sheets with your partner. When these type of occultist women mean capable of anything and everything, they really mean like things that you would, your, your brain would be scarred from, okay? So like attracts like. So when she says, I knew you were going to come, and then she says, 
I am capable of anything and everything. That means who she, who's coming to her is also capable of that. Mm. So they are of the same wing. They are of the same type of entity. And it says, make me your Aphrodite. So Aphrodite, she, and as we all know, is this lust type of woman who has this sort of beautification aspect about her. And when the Greeks painted her, drew her, you know, she was a bit of a vice for the other male deities in their pantheon. Yes, her beauty was supposedly noted and stuff, but she was, as I guess if we would call her, a most definite fitna, right? Mm. She is somebody who can bring down the noble warriors and make them overwhelmed with female energy. That's so, yeah, and so she's that part of that. She says, make me your one and only. So here you get a little bit of a paradox because one and only is this really amount of control. It's really gripping. Now she's inverted it because we know, well, obviously if you were gonna have one and only you'd get married, you know, you get, you, you get married and you wouldn't be talking about Aphrodite who was not monogamous. You know, she was spread around, her energy was spread around. She was not one and only, not even to any of the deities in the what remains of the knowledge concerning her. And so she says, so you want to play with magic? Boom, right there. Right you see there. it? Wow. So she just tells you right there, like, okay, I knew you were going to come to me. And then she says, anything and everything. For somebody in the occult, we all know that they go beyond what the, the, the mind should see, do, and hear, right? What you say, everything. They go beyond. So it says, boy, so notice this boy angle here. Aphrodite is a grown woman. She is a woman who is being promoted to 15-year-old boys as this sort of lust goddess, mm. right? So the young Greek men would see Aphrodite and be like, wow, you know, I want to experience someone like that. If you look at Pompeii with all their brothels, the young men could actually go to those places. You know, the Roman senators had their young sons go to those places right so there's a lot of layers here of not only you know greek and roman paganism in macedonia as well but also the occult and then mixed with this language of boy is not yet a man okay boy you should know what you're falling for so there's a bit of a slap in the face right there what are you falling for you're falling for a trick you're falling for magic right there it tells you you want to play with magic you should know what you're falling for an illusion something that's not real something that you shouldn't put your nose in. Curiosity killed the cat. Like already here, there is this angle of if there's an entity who's going to do something to you, you should know what's going to happen. You, as Remember when the two angels who, Harut and Marut, right? Who yeah. taught magic. That's that the verse that we were just partner. looking at. Yeah. Yeah. And how they said like, we are just a trial. Uh, you know, like they had to say it, right? And you had to understand what was happening. Here you see a little bit of a play at that. It's like, <laughs> what are you falling for? So yeah. she's telling the young man, you should know what you're getting into. And you can't blame anyone but yourself because you've been notified. That's right? exactly like the shaitan in the Quran. He's like, yeah. don't blame me, blame yourself. <laughs> exactly. And so it says, baby, dare you do this? So already she had two admonitions right there. There's like this coying like like you know how you toy with somebody like you want to play you want to play it's like how you talk to a dog in a way you ever talked i don't know if you've had a dog but you're like come on boy come on boy mm -hmm. there's just sort of like baiting there so when she says you know but don't make me your enemy your enemy your enemy it's like oh don't make me your enemy oh so you want to play with magic oh you should know what you're falling for there's a lot of bouncing back and forth here right mm -hmm. and it's really interesting because she goes, dare you do this? So again, there's all these warnings here for the youth when they're listening to something like this. And I know a lot of the pop stars, they'll be like a lot of the fans, just like me, maybe when I was like 18, you think it's all nothing, but there's something there. It's a consciousness, a, a way of dealing with men that is being taught to the women. This is how you talk to men and how men should look for a woman who talks like this, mm. right? And it really shows you like you're not having, as we would say, Haya, you're not having dignity. You're not having righteousness. A, a decent mother isn't going to talk like this, you know? And I know they'll call us prudes and all the words they use, but they're, they're telling you while also not telling you. So, and since she says here, 
because I'm coming at you like a dark horse. Now, a dark horse in the night is difficult to see. Mm. Okay. If somebody has a black cloak on and they're riding towards you in the dark forest in a time where there's only maybe a few torches along the way, this rider can only hear, you can only hear them by their footsteps. And what's scary about a dark horse rider is you don't know if they're a friend or foe until they're already there and the blade is out. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. So you, when the, when the rider's coming, you ears perk up. Is this an enemy or is this a foe? Think about if you're walking to your farm in the deep mountains, right? You're going to panic. You're going to have a sense of who is this? And then when that sword comes out, they can nip your neck. I mean, think of how we have the legends of Sleepy Hollow, the headless black horse rider who would come and snatch off your head, steal your head and stuff it in a tree. Um, there's a lot of symbology, you know, not only in occultism, but of the color of a horse, you know, is something that even the prophet peace be upon him speaks about. I remember reading a hadith in Buhari about a chestnut horse is better. And that had, I, th I think he said, a white mark on its head. The coloring was mentioned. And, and some people, you know, don't understand coloring, but the way in which you spot and pick a horse, it, it's really important. And then it says, are you ready for, ready for a perfect storm, a perfect storm? So a perfect storm, uh, when you're in a ship, right, you're going through it, a captain knows Oh boy, when he says it's a perfect storm, that means there's rain, there's thunder, you cannot see, and your ship is blowing all around. And this is the moment when the crew is tested. Mm. This is not an easy trial. The people in the ship have to tie the mast. They have to endure the waves spilling on the deck, right? The captain is now being tested fully to relegate everybody, to delegate and to make sure everyone can sail to their shining shores. So when she says magic and perfect storm, you get another area of this is going to be a very huge trial for this young man. So as we said, Aphrodite was, you know, somebody who caused problems for uh, all the male warriors. Any woman who worshipped Aphrodite was looking to have power over some of those male soldiers because, you know, they actually had to fight face to face with their warriors and it, it's a problem you know if you, if your soldiers are distracted too much by women you know the, the so way you the, the way you're explaining this is very interesting in the sense that i've always thought about how in the quran uh sheikh omar the shaitan always tells you what he's going to do yeah this is very interesting it's like his son he has to always before he does a thing he has to tell you he's about to do it and these performers, what's interesting about them is, you know, they've already made their their packs with with the devil, however they did it or whether they were aware of it or not. But it's like they have to tell you what they're actually doing to you while they do it so that you yes. have no excuse with God on the day of judgment. The shaitan never wants to actually force us to commit sins because then we have excuses. Like on the day of judgment, we can say, well, I actually had no choice. I was compelled beyond my means to do this thing. But he wants you to feel like you have no choice but do this well, through fear, when in reality, you always have a choice, which is Teweko, to depend on Allah. Exactly, exactly. And if you notice here, remember when it says, be mine, only mine, there was that sort of marriage bridal talk. But here you see, because once you're mine, you're mine. It's a very mm. threatening tone there, kind of psychotic, yeah. you know, it's like, what? What do you mean? I can't divorce. I can't leave. Like, no, once you're mine, you're mine. And it says there, no going back. So once what do you, you mean? Hold your soul. It's done. Exactly. Right. So it's like Aphrodite and then using this lust power, perfect storm. So you want to play the baiting language. You hear it and then continues. Mark my words. Now already there you saw that the playful, coy, baiting, taunting language. And now you see, once you're mine, there's no going back, mark my words. It's a threat. So a young man is being threatened by this sort of lust goddess. And if you don't know, some of the worshipers of uh, Bacchus used to, there were women who would get drunk and then they would go and tear apart the rabbits. Yeah, the cult of Bacchus, so the, the Dionysus uh, deity, right? So they would unhinge themselves, and women who were part of that were 
pretty, you know, whoa, you know, you definitely got to watch out for those ladies. So when you hear a threat like this, a young man hears a threat like this, and a woman is willing to threaten a man with that kind of clutching, think about how the woman went after Yusuf. May Allah be pleased with right, him. Right. She ripped his shirt. You know, she cornered him. She planned it. She knew what she was doing. And he was able to get out of it. But when you hear there is no going back means you can't turn your back on a woman. If you turn the back on a woman, she's going to come after your neck. She's going to do something to you. So this is very, you know, threatening behavior masked behind lust, the illusion. It's also right? an inversion of like the feminine, like women, women traditionally right. are not the aggressor in, in relationships. They're kind of like, you know, the man comes in and he initiates things and so forth and so on. But this is like taking the inverted, you know, uh, stance on everything. Like the woman here seems to be the one who's putting off all the energy. Yes. And is a very um, possessive, you know, needy, clingy language, which can make someone feel suffocated. You know, it's like, uh, there's a point of when the woman is so on top of the person, it feels like an octopus on your face. You know, like, let me breathe. So, I mean, it's quite strange. And so she says, this love will make you levitate. And as we know, in black magic rituals, people try to levitate right. um, and exit their body mentally, but they try to do it physically as well. So you're Dr. like, Omar oh. used to do that, the um, astral projection when he was learning about it. I remember him mentioning that. There you go, you see? And then it says, like a bird, like a bird without a cage, but down to earth. If you choose to walk away, don't walk away. Now, the weird part here is that like a bird is going to be something that's going to soar. You have the highs and your lows, but without the cage, you can't really grasp the bird and the bird is not really within your control. And as someone who owns a bird, you know, who's a bird person, that kind of language is like, huh, well, once the bird's out of the cage, it's no longer yours unless the bird comes back by its own will. But she already said, once you're mine, you're mine, there's no going back. So what do you mean? It's not like a bird without a cage. If someone's yours and they're yours, they're going to stay in the cage. So there seems to be some type of play on words here, right? Down to earth means calm. But obviously we could see within the lyrics, that's not calm. If you're down to earth, you're like, okay, if you leave, you leave. And alhamdulillah, right? That's down to earth. But if someone's like, you can't even turn your back. You're like, wait a minute, you know, now you're on a peak. Now you're on a, a stepping stool. Now you're on the top of the pyramid acting like fear to own. That's not down to earth. You have ego, you have narcissism, you have possession. That's not down to earth at all, right? And then it says, it's in the palm of your hand now, baby. Now, again, notice the language here, boy and baby, a man who hasn't come to fruition. Someone both a mentally baby because he's immature, hasn't recognized this psycho woman, and also spiritually immature as well, because Yusuf and a, a man really instilled in his masculinity is not going to tolerate that kind of talk, right? By the way, this uh, this word baby, I'm sorry to interrupt you, is is used like ubiquitously in pop music and in oh, relationships. Know, and I remember even when I was in the early 90s and there was all these pop songs in the mid 90s that came out and baby bits and baby that is always used. It's like it's like a way of programming the listener to think about their relationships on an infantile level. Mm. Like, what, right? why would you call your significant other baby? It doesn't even make any sense. Uh, can we pause here? We need to praise a lot to OK, totally. Yeah. 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 So we're just going to pause. So, yeah, so let's go back and continue with our discussion here. So we're at that last portion, I think, over there. OK, so we got into the perfect storm analogy and then talked about the threatening language. So here again, you see she's a beast. Well, a beast, naturally, is something quite vicious, something that cannot be tamed, something that is bloodthirsty, and something that bites its feeder. So essentially, a beast is not a docile, domesticated animal, just to make it clear, because sometimes people use beastly in terms of, you know, football, you know, we, we reduce the meaning down, 
away from the way in which it was used to describe a very vicious entity, right? So if she's mentioned Aphrodite and she's used threatening language and she's called herself a perfect storm, asking him, are you ready? Are you ready? This repetition and that she's coming like a dark horse, right? Now she's called herself a beast. So not only has she given herself a lot of dark symbology around her energy, but she's also used words like baby and boy, right? And she says, she's a beast. I call her karma. So here is kind of a weird part because it's almost sounding like he deserves it. You mm. got what you asked for. Now you're going to yeah. get it, right? So karma well, for in them a way is it's like, true. Oh. She warned him <laughs> over yeah, and over exactly. again. Right, right. And so it's like what goes around comes around. So it's the circular, what, well, you started it. Now you're going to finish it. So, so sister, what do you say delete? about, for example, parents, right? It's yeah. such easy child management to put them in front of a TV screen or to give them the phone to watch whatever they want to watch. And if you don't give them the phone, the child is going to say, well, all my friends have it. Why can't I have it? You're a bad parent. Uh, and then on the one side, we got this type of thing. This is just a small, small microscopic uh, example of what's out there that's happening over and over and over and over again. And for years and years for maybe some children and they're falling into this deeper and deeper and deeper without the parents. I think, was it you that said this, that it's without even the parents knowing what's going on. And, and Isa, brother Isa, Imam Isa just gave the example that, you know, giving a phone to your child is like giving a, a weapon to your child to shoot his or her Iman. And exactly. And this song is promoted in restaurant chains, right? It's on commercials. It's heavily promoted onto you. And, you know, it, Christian parents, unfortunately, it, you know, they they have really fallen for it. Since music is not something really Muslims have around them because we know it's Haram, this affects the religious groups that allow music even more heavily. So hmm. thus giving Shaitan's army like more of a foothold. You see what I'm saying? It used and to so, be prohibited in Christianity long time ago. Yeah. You know what I, I just yeah. realized about this horse that you were just mentioning? It just, uh, it could be random, but it could also not be random. Is the verse where Shaitan says, I will use my voice. He also mentions horses. Mm -hmm. Uh, there you go. Over here. Yeah. And I will incite them senseless wherever they will, wherever you can with your voice and assault them with your horses. So there you go. But it means metaphorically, uh, you know, in the dark night, this, you know. And he'll become a partner with their money and children. Right. <laughs> yeah. That, that right. has a lot of explanation to it that we can go into one day but yeah i mean so this is like interesting uh that that verse also mentions horse and you happen to pick out a song uh using that so exactly when... and if you go down okay call her, yeah. yeah so we noticed the jeffrey dahmer aspect here so i want you to see a a, a type of lineage we've gone down here we've gone from positive not necessarily okay not positive but more lighthearted from Aphrodite to Dahmer. We've gone from up to down within the song <laughs> as the song goes from beginning to end. You see that? So first it's kind of coy, kind of baity, and now it's, oh, a beast. Eat your heart out, Jeffrey Dahmer, a serial killer. Wow. This is the language a woman is using to entice a man, and this is what she's teaching young girls to talk to men like. <laughs> a sycophantic serial killer. Yes. And then men wonder why they're psychologically abused by these woke feminists who, you know, like adopt this lady as their icon, their sex icon, right? So it's like, huh, like the, they give her awards with the little golden statues. They give her money. They shower her. She even does videos. This dark horse video was done with Egyptian symbology, oh, you know? Okay. Yeah, there is. And, you know, she's got her whole body out, right? And here, though, you notice she says, be careful, try not to lead her on. Shodi's heart was on steroids because her love was so strong. So this is the part where the guy sings, right? And he, a guy is saying, uh, Juicy J, a guy who's historically very vulgar with women, who, who is a pimp, 
who, you know, treats women horrifically. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm too familiar with his music, but he's a terrible guy. So he says to, he's saying to other men, hey, try not to lead her on. So he's warning other men about her and her heart is on steroids. So it's, you know, it's too forward. It's too strong. It's too, her will, her is just beastly, right? She can't restrain herself. So <clears throat> you see this, like, now remember the playing with words? Because her love was so strong. What do you mean? She said she's a beast. Ain't no love in beasts. A beast has no lack, like, they don't, they, they lack mercy. That's what makes them a beast. They mm -hmm. don't have sympathy. You can't be a beast with sympathy, right? And if you, if you want to tie in another analogy, it's Beauty and the Beast from Disney was also a very, you know, strange type of being abused in a castle by a royal right and you know the only friends you have are talking furniture is very dystopian <laughs> you know like you know there's something going on there so this beast love is very dystopian then it continues you may fall in love when you meet her if you get the chance you better keep her she swears by it, but if you break her heart, she turns cold as a freezer. So this is the part where he sings. Now notice this. You better keep her. She's warned you. Why would you want to keep somebody who describes himself as a beast? You know this uh, Stockholm Syndrome here, where people get abused mentally, and it's hard for them to leave. Remember she said, you can't turn your back on me in the song? Now the guy is gaslighting the male boy who's unaware, saying, you better keep her. Wait a minute. She said, I have no choice. I can't even turn my back on her. Right. She says, you know, all these different things. What are you saying? So if the Jeffrey Dahmer, whenever his victims tried to escape, they couldn't. They were drugged and they were killed. There was no escape. There was one woman who escaped. Uh, but Jeffrey Dahmer also went into a fraternity house of women, a sorority house, and he butchered them all in their beds while they were sleeping. OK. So he snuck into her all-girl sorority and butchered them in her beds. So notice, it's like, oh, you better keep her. This sort of really sick, like, oh, you'll like her, but you need to be scared of her, right? It's very twisted, very twisted. She'll turn cold as a freezer. So that one's more weak, but a lot of the cold-hearted women are called beastly, you know? Aphrodite was associated with kind of warm lust. So there's this play of, from hot to cold, hot to cold. When a woman has bipolar disorder, she's hot and cold, hot and cold. And you don't know how to really navigate the emotions. It's very hard for men to deal with somebody who has constant mood swings, you know? So if she's going hot and then cold, already that's like, it's a lot of oppression on the male mind. It continues, the fairy tale ending with a knight in shining armor. She can be my sleeping beauty. I'm going to put her in a coma. Now, Okay, this is all so, like homicidal language, you know, <laughs> like the relationship. Yes. And so what's really creepy about Sleeping Beauty is now Sleeping Beauty was put to sleep by a jealous witch. Right. right? She also was magic. somebody. Yep. Yeah. And her parents, uh, you know, they didn't want that to happen. And she was kissed in her sleep against without her consent and then was awakened from her sleep because of a kiss. Right. So. To put someone in a coma where somebody can kiss them without their consent is necrophilic, right? Jeffrey Dahmer used to have sex with his dead victims. Do you see right. the connection? Mm -hmm. So it's like they're really bringing in the total, like the darkness here. You know, truly the song lives up to its name. And if you know, a lot of sorority girls, they accidentally, stupidly, they get knocked out from drugs and the frat boys pull a train on them. And then they wake up and they've had 10 guys while they were passed around. It's quite horrible. So there's a lot of different like connections here that don't have the Disney ending, as we could say, right? So then it goes, her love is like a drug. Well, he just kind of mentioned the coma part. You can have a medically induced coma, right? So if her love really was like a drug, I, they're confusing love with, you know, narcotics, because it's ecstasy, the drugs are, they release dopamines that mirror actual connection. And that's why addicts have a very hard time breaking their addiction because it mirrors this strong urge, right? He continues, whoa, 
I think I love her. She's so bad. I'm sprung and I don't care. Sprung means like you leap at anything that that woman does and asks for. So no man can be sprung in that way. It, it, you're not supposed to be turned out or sprung on a woman who describes herself in such a way. Then you're a puppet. You're no longer a, a sovereign, righteous man. You are a boy who's been, you know, who's the, you know, pinata of the woman, right? She's got me on a roller coaster. Now, you remember how I said hot and cold, hot and cold? A mental roller coaster. Up and down, up and down, swirling around. And when you get high on drugs, there's this swirling there, this nauseating feeling, right? There's the highs and the lows. So there's a lot of play here, both on emotional connection and drug connection. And she says, turn the bedroom into a fair. Now, a fair, if you think of the classic horror type of fair, there's like, a, you know, there would be freak shows, a bearded lady, two-headed person, mm. uh, a, a small midget with a deformity, right? They're not thinking of the happy fair where you go see cows and chickens. There used to be circus fairs where there were tour with people who were, you know, quite a bit strange, right? So I think American Horror Story also even had a series called uh, the, the Fair or the Circus or who was something like that. But the bedroom is a fair is, you know, very Caligula energy because Caligula of Rome, he turned the palace into an actual like really strange place where he had even amputees in his uh, harem, right? He had a very sick fetish. By the and way, then the, he fair, continues the fair uh, attracts children, right? That's who the uh, primary audience is. Exactly, right? And he says, I was trying to hit and quit it, but I'm, but little mama's so dope. So do you see her love is like a drug and dope. You see that dope is a drug and he keeps comparing her love to a drug. See, a drug reduces you, brings you down, makes you have cancer, it makes you sick. It allows you to be, you know, manipulated to be to have your inhibitions lowered, right? If so, if so, if it's a righteous love, that love's going to fortify you. It's going to make you brave against the storm. It's going to make you forward. It's not. It's going to elevate you. It's not going to debase you, right? So, this coma, this drug, this roller coaster. It's it's very potent language here, and he says. I messed around and got addicted. What did I say about Stockholm syndrome? Getting used to your abuser, right? You've been abused so much that you just, you know what? I'm just going to deal with it. It's this vampiric, uh, addictive love that is psychologically abusive, right? And so she's already called him boy, baby, right? Aphrodite, Jeffrey Dahmer, dark horse, right? It's like, whoa, you really are, right? He's not lying. And so she says again here, so you want to play with magic. Boy, you should know what you're falling for. Baby, do you dare to do this? So she's like saying, are you sure you want to do this? You want to play? And then calls him boy again and asks him if he's ready, mentions the perfect storm, and then says, you know, there's no going back. So all the entire song, when you break it down, it's more than meets the eye. And that's the problem with the liberal progressive atheists is they call the religious community all these names. They don't want people to have regulations on the music industry. They don't, they call you every name in the book, a misogynist, conspiracy theorist, patriarchy supporter. Brilliant. You know, they call you every kind of name if you analyze the lyrics of their own works and then call you, you know, like they gaslight you. It's not true what you're saying. It's like, okay, then why are you writing songs like that? Because it sells. Why does it sell? Because sex sells. Okay, so if you know sex sells and drugs are potent, why can't we point out what you're doing, right? So they don't want you to mess up the money flow. They don't want you to kind of make men more than, than these women's objects. And they don't really want the girls to kind of have this sense of modesty to treat men better because they want to break up the family. Well, you're most certainly going to break up the family if you have women marching around the world who think like that and husbands who want to try something like that. Well, there's no going back because once you did the deed, uh, it's done. And you can't turn back time. But with our language, Allah is the acceptor of repentance. We have forgiveness. We can change. But there, it's a very finitive language. 
you know, once it's dun dun dun, like they they have it there structured. So repeating this song over and over artificially on the airwaves and kids memorizing it, you download it. Girls listening to this as they work out, they put it in clubs, nightclubs, right? You go on the street, you hear it, you're waiting for this, your this cheeseburger. This is the Shapon's Quran. That's what the music industry <laughs> there is. There's like Hamza Yusuf, he complained one day, he said that I wish I could sue these uh, jingle writers who wrote these songs that even to this day, I can't get them out of my head. Like I still remember all the rock bands that I used to listen to. I know their lyrics very well, even to this day. I, I probably know more than them, unfortunately, than I even do of the Quran. But but it goes to show you that Allah sent something, right? And the shaitan brought his his version of it to give you. One is giving you guidance towards nor, and the other one is bringing you towards volumat, <laughs> to like multiple levels of darkness. And yes. this overwhelming yes. theme of darkness all the time, darkness, your spirituality blackened, your ability to have insight darkened out so you can't see and the spell is cast over you. Yes, and then now we have a just epidemic of mentally ill people and people who are overly medicated, right? But you know, it's it's really making people all these different chemicals in their bodies making their brain just like Alice in Wonderland, just woo, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I have different personality every minute, and it's destabilizing uh, relationship because nobody really wants to deal with that all the time, you know. It's exhausting having to deal with these roller coaster women who have a power over you because of their Aphrodite and Jeffrey Dahmer vibe, you know? And this is why I'm very, very motivated to, as much as I can without getting censorship on my back, trying to wake men up to this kind of, not only is it just shaitan, but the woke feminist agenda. I mean, it's real. And it's like when they say they want to disrupt the patriarchy, toxic masculinity put boys on estrogen they're not lying you know well remember that at, this is this is yeah. a, i'm sorry to interrupt you again the uh important thing to understand about the occult and and the, the gnostic religion they follow is they they worship a male female god right so so their their concept of tohid is that god has all the aspects of, of and so they want the men to become in touch with their femininity because that's an aspect of knowledge that they have not accessed in their self and the same thing is they want the women to be like men because then they'll they become complete and so there's this graying of everything but for them they teach in gnosticism that it's that you're if if you don't access this part of yourself that there's there's these experiences that you'll never have and never know and there's this aspect of knowledge that you can't access but what they're not they're obfuscating here is that's what happens when you marry right the masculine mm -hmm. and feminine come together it produces children right mm -hmm. as opposed to these songs which don't produce any children. there's no mention of children here or families or real relationships it's just like like the guy said hit it and quit it you know it's uh the the, the all of this stuff is about wiping out the family unit it's about uh people losing the the in their innate self and becoming something they're not it's about you embracing the dark side but painting the dark side as if it's some level of knowledge that you need to access and if you access it you'll be more complete but it destroys you in the process yes and now we are seeing some of the most aggressive women i think we've probably ever seen because it's true there was women warriors but they had a creed and a code that was very like, okay, nationalistic, right? Defend your farm. And like, if you look at old Western art of like a woman, you know, has a shotgun, she's gonna, you know, protecting her crops is very different than today's slap men, beat men, degrade men, manipulate them, extract their money, crush their testicles with your heels. It's, it's very, very scary if you have sons you know, who you're like, oh boy, you got to worry about so many different angles now. And these mantras, these musical mantras that are played over and over and over and over, the little girls are hearing it while their mom is driving in the car, smoking a cigarette, eating bad food. And her kid is hearing this and like it, the, the bouncy, 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 bouncy. And you're like, wow, you know, it, this is this is something that we have to talk about. And if they make fun of us, it's fine, but we have to point it out because once we point out the other perspective, which they don't want, 
it helps to wake people up to say, you know what, turn off this garbage, you know? Well, the and whole point of the men... Nemesis uh, should be to break the spell anyway, like yeah. to point out that this is a spell and you don't have to participate in it. And if you just disconnect from it, you unplug from it, it won't affect you. But to say that this is not affecting you and you're plugged into it is foolishness. That's what exactly. many of the people feel is that, oh, it doesn't affect me. I mean, it's not going to affect me. They wouldn't do it if it wasn't affecting you. <laughs> exactly. You wouldn't turn to it. These women, they turn to it to feel better. When they get in an argument with their boyfriend or their husband, they turn on this music to revamp them. And what is it telling them? Yeah, you, you're powerful. You're this, you're that. I'll, I'll show him. It changes the energy instead of saying, you know what? I think I overreacted. I'm going to go to Walgreens and buy a sorry card. I'm, I'm going to make a good dinner tonight for him. I'm sorry. Right. Totally different vibe. That's right? interesting. There's a book. Uh, it's called Artificial Happiness, right? Part of the big part of the book is talking about medications and what the because when we talk about side effects, we'll ta always talk about physical side effects. Right. But this book was talking about the psychological side effects. So, for example, husband, wife have a fight and now the wife feels guilty. And she says, sorry, and the cycle repeats, right? But once you start taking certain medications, what happens is the guilt goes away. And in, in, in the field of psychology, they hate the idea of guilt. Yes. They hate the idea of shame, guilt, right? Whereas the Quran praises the guilt, like you're a living person, you're spiritually living if you feel guilty for doing something wrong. That's what Tawba is, like feeling guilty for something, doing something wrong. Yeah, if me and you get into a fight, we feel guilty, we make up. But then this, like, they don't want to deal with guilt. They want to do away with this feeling of guilt. And Allah swears by guilt. Hmm. I never thought about that. That's yeah. interesting. And, and see, and then, and then in the same surah, in the very same surah, when Allah talks about the human psyche, Allah says, Inna al -insan ala nafsihi basira. Man has full insight to himself. But he makes excuses. But he makes excuses, right? And so the excuses is not to feel the guilt. Right? So you, you make excuses not to feel the guilt. And what is mod when you, you said a very interesting statement, sister. You said, and I wanted, I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, that's an interesting statement. She said, modesty, uh, she said something about modesty and something about treating the husband right she made some connection in, in just a few minutes ago she said modesty is about treating the man right or something like this but that's interesting because uh a person who is not going to feel guilty is going to treat her husband like trash yes absolutely <laughs> you know yeah. so and vice versa you know the problem is both the thing is that there's an extreme problem on both sides right so you don't have real masculine masculine manhood and you don't have islamic chivalry anymore and then you also don't have real womanhood anymore and people are in kind of like idolizing both of these extremes and so uh that's the problem we're in and and these songs uh are a big part of that problem and the videos yeah. that accompany them hello Muhammad. yeah okay yeah so uh any last words uh, Imam Isa? Muslim village. Get out of these cities. Turn <laughs> yeah. off your cell phones. Uh, unless, have, yeah. have a jama, have a hijra plan. Uh, so the way I, I tell people nowadays, fatwa, Islamic chivalry. Revival of Islamic chivalry. Number two, you must, cannot be alone. You have to have a jama. You have to have an amir. You have to have a shura. Number three, you have to have a hijra plan. You have to have a plan to get out of this satanic kind of like fake money, fake everything. The empire of illusions. Yeah, the empire of illusions. And number number four, you got to make your hijra. You got to establish your Medina and make jihad or whatever it means to defend that area that you'll be in. And so that's uh, one way to one sure way the prophet told us to deal with things in the end of times. So and, and so, so subscribe to uh, Milan's channel, philosoph Milan Philosopher Philosophers Corner. Thank you. Hear, to hear more from her, of course. Uh, actually, I had some people in uh, Sheikh Omar's comment section ask if I have a channel. I I may start my own channel, but you can find more content of me talking about specifically signs of the hour if you go to UNCG 
MSA. This is the uh, University of North Carolina at Greensboro's Muslim Student Association's webpage. You'll find like 10 hours of talks I did on signs of the hour. So if you, okay, yeah, give if, us if you really want to see more of me, <laughs> you can go there and look at that. But I may start a channel of my own, inshallah. I think you should start a channel. And also, I think that both of you should start a channel on BitChute, Odyssey, Rumble, because tech censorship is coming. Okay. We're ahead of it here. now. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's going to get to the point where real people, we're going to be kicked out and we have to be able to encourage our people to migrate to different apps because YouTube promotes, I mean, I've had videos just on basically me reading the Quran gets censored and then, um, but you'll see like Takashi 69 rap videos, you know, Cardi B, you see utter degeneracy, right? So we have to recognize the leftist activists work in these organizations. They throttle your channel. They hold you down. They infect you with bot spammers. You have to be careful, and we have to. You have to have our eggs in many baskets. Yeah. We literally can't put it off anymore. We have to do. We have to create our own websites. We have to set up the safety net to help other people. We can stay in and try to help people get out, right? To influence the digital sphere, but we have to expand and you know put our ideas on apps that have less censorship essentially the good thing about bit shoot and odyssey at least because uh, i do have an odyssey channel mm. so uh the good thing about that is if the subscribers go there they don't have to deal with the silly ads exactly you know so if you want to just listen to the content without worrying about ads then subscribe to the odyssey channel and uh, then I need, you know, I don't usually upload like things as quickly, but I don't know, maybe I should reverse it. Maybe I should do Odyssey first and then send it to YouTube. I'm not sure how that would be another reason. to. Maybe well, that way it's already ask, there before yeah. you. So if it does get taken down off YouTube, there's automatically a place for people to go to get it. Exactly. Yeah. So Muhammad, I think that, you know, it's a serious thing if you want to, but a part of me just feels like if it gets shut down, and just work here and just get everything ready here to move and and to make the hijrah so it's like as long as it's there okay fine say something uh and uh if it's taken away then just it just will focus my energy more locally uh i don't know Allah okay thank you everyone uh inshallah jazakum Allah khairan assalamu alaikum